skills. <laughs> I'm privileged again and thankful for the opportunity to share covet your prayers, and I hope you have been. I trust you have been through the week. I don't take this lightly, and I want to share with you, as I would always share with you, that anytime, at least from my perspective, anytime that I share something from the Word of God, it's not because I'm coming from a position of mastery. It's because I'm coming, and I forgot to turn this on. I think I'm on now, brother. Coming from a position of a learner, <clears throat> and I want to mature, and you look at me with my hoary head, and you think you should be real mature by this point. But it's amazing the freshness of the Word of God and what He shows you every time you delve into it. And uh, I started, I, I, I kind of had the seed for this, actually, when Brother Jordan asked me to share at the rest home a few weeks back when he was ill, and I jumped in there and shared, and, and it was funny because right after I had preached this message or a portion of this message, literally the next day, the Lord tested me in the most gargantuan and obvious way about what had just come out of my mouth literally the day before. And I'd like to tell you that I just passed with flying colors, and I know that the Lord was honored, but He had to remind me more than once to stop what I was doing, and I'm not talking about physically, to stop in my head, stop in my whatever, and really just stand on the truth of the Word of God and let that be released because of what we're going to see in a moment. I want to start at the end of one of Paul's letters and then try to go back to the beginning to understand why. So I'm not talking about the beginning of the letter, but I'm saying he's giving a conclusion to his teaching. And if you've ever done any type of teaching or whatever, you want the very summary if you want to call it that, of what you've presented, even if it's in a book, to kind of encapsulate all the things that you've said all the way through. And it's certainly not going to do that in a full version, but it's going to put some highlight points. And that's what I want you to see in 1 Thessalonians, if you'll turn there with me to begin with. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And it's interesting because almost all these verses that I'm going to share with you have come up fairly recently in messages in different ways, maybe not the exact same emphasis, but it's like the Lord kind of wants to remind us over and over again of some really basic things that really bring fruitfulness to our walk with the Lord if we're born again, if we're saved. So look at uh, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians. We're going to start in verse 16, three verses that probably many people stick on the refrigerator. They're common verses to see. It says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything, give thanks. And then he says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I've heard somebody, I don't remember who it was, from this very pulpit talk about understanding, discerning what the will of God is. And the will of God is very broad, but it is very simple in these terms. He tells us, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything, give thanks. Now, interestingly enough, on my birthday... Miss Pam pinned me this little scripture placard to go on my desk. Guess what it said? In everything, give thanks. And once again, right on the heels of the Lord spanking my bottom about a week before about it, here comes Miss Pam unbeknownst, and she presents me with this same scriptural reminder. I need that in front of my eyeballs every single day. So it's going to stay on my desk, and I'm sure I'll be tested more than one time. But I want you to understand that this charge, this admonition that's given is not just a one-time get it and be done thing. In fact, we're going to see when we look in Ephesians here in just a moment, if you want to turn there, Ephesians 5, that when Paul says a similar thing to the church at Ephesus, he puts it in the context of being filled with the Spirit. Do you hunger as a believer, as a born-again child of God, to be full of the Holy Spirit? Is that something that you seek after? Is it something you long for? Is it something that you desire? If so, then you're going to see how critical this area of giving thanks in everything is to being filled with the Spirit. So let's look again in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 15 here. And Paul says to the church at Ephesus, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And he talks here, he says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding again what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he says about that, speaking to yourselves 
in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks, I want to read that verse again, verse 20 for emphasis, giving thanks always for all things. I'm going to say it one more time. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, let's get, as the old saying goes, where the rubber meets the road. Or, or a, a more biblical term would be, let's be doers of the word and not just hearers when we hear something like that instruction to us. Because it's not conditional. He's not talking to us about when things are going peachy keen and you're not suffering any difficulty in your life and you're not having any struggles. Certainly in those times, we're going to see that the Lord calls us to give thanks, to recognize from whom those gifts come. But it's also when things are not at all pretty that He calls us to give thanks. And I read several commentaries about this because there can be arguments about, you know, take the worst case scenario and whatever it comes up in your imagination, it really isn't important what the thing is. Let's say horrifically you lose a child or you know, you have a horrible sickness, whatever that thing is, it's not commanding us to say, thank you, God, for my child being gone. It's not a command to say, thank you, God, for this horrible sickness. But it's in the midst of that situation, God's rising up, welling up within us the ability to thank Him for who He is and for what He's working, even when we can't see what that would be. Paul knew this. He knew it from several aspects. He knew it because he'd studied the Scripture. And I want to take you through a quick journey. I'm going to call this the uh, Highway 1 of Psalms. Go back to Psalms 92 for me, and we're going to skip through several. I'm going to make you bounce around a lot tonight, but Brother Jordan already said he might fall asleep, so it's the only way that I'm going to keep you awake is to have you flipping pages a whole lot. And by the way, I saw that macaroni and cheese is neat. I thought that just was something you got in a box from, it's called craft. You throw it in the boiling water, and that's all there is to it. And I can even cook that. So if you need that part, I'm going to fill that in for you. So Psalm 92.1, it says this, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. It is a good thing, it says. Again, I just get down to the basic simplicity. When you read something in the Bible that says it's a good thing to do, it kind of makes me want to hang on to it and, and believe that the Lord had a good intention and reason for saying, if it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to His name, then it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, sing praises unto His name. Look at Psalm 105, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the people. Sing unto Him. Sing psalms unto Him. Talk ye of all His wondrous works. Glory ye to His holy, in His holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face evermore. Remember His marvelous works that He's done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. Jump over to Psalm 106. Verse 1, praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord, and who can show forth all His praise? Psalm 107, verse 1, O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom He hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Psalm 118, verse 1. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, because His mercy endureth forever. And then jump over to Psalm 136, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for His mercy endureth forever. 
O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endureth forever. To Him who alone doeth great wonders, for His mercy endureth forever. To Him that by wisdom made the heavens, for His mercy endureth forever. And I could go on. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Do you hear that? Mercy, mercy, mercy. His mercy is new to us every morning. We get to wake up if He gives us breath and heartbeat. We get to wake up to a whole new batch of His mercy being poured out before us. Not just for us, not to sit on ourselves, but to be able to spread, to minister, to speak that truth to others. You know, this this giving thanks, this thanksgiving word comes up, I think I saw like about 60, 70 times just in the Old Testament. That's Old Testament. And what my focus is here is to say that Paul, who was Saul, who you remember from when I preached a few weeks ago, if you listen to that, he was the Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He knew this Bible. He knew the Old Testament. He knew it backwards and forwards. He'd spent all his life studying it. And in that study for him, this concept of giving thanks to the Lord was a massive truth to him. It was something that when he got born again and when the Spirit of God came into him and, and now it gave new life, it wasn't a law to him anymore. It was very the very essence or, or being of who God is, of his character, of the Lord Jesus Christ in him. It just it just brought all that word that he knew to such life and such light. And so for him to say to you, to me, to the church at Ephesus, to everyone that would follow him, to say to himself, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks in everything. He had a perspective on it that was very deep and very real. It wasn't just intellectual. And I loved that this morning. Brother Jordan, when you were talking so much about that difference, between us having a head knowledge about something versus having a heart knowledge about something. And this is one of those areas where I'm appealing to you very practically today, no matter how the Lord, you know, whatever this vessel is, went through the word that the Lord speaks to you today and you walk out of this place, the Lord wants to change not just how you look at things, but how you walk in that truth. He's going to give you the same test. I can guarantee you he's going to allow, let me put it that way, that same test for you. It may be even before you walk out the door here today of looking at something, a, a circumstance, a, an experience in your life and being able to say, do I wish to honor the Lord? Do I wish to bring, bring pleasure to Him, to bring glory to Him by instead of choosing what naturally rises up in me when difficulty comes, which is grumbling, which is complaining, instead of choosing that, to know that I've been empowered by the Spirit of God by the very Word of God, to be able to give thanks to Him in everything. I think about so often, you know, raising kids, some of you don't have that experience yet, some of you may not get to, and, and the Lord will teach you in His own different ways, but if you've ever parented, it is a maddening so often in the human to understand, and it really shouldn't be, we came from the same place of how often we have to over and over and over and over again speak the same thing or drill something in and how quickly it can be forgotten and turned away. There is such a need in those moments for us practically as parents to know that God has given us the ability to give thanks to Him when little squirt is speaking that no that one more defiant time in your face and if they don't say it with their mouths, they're saying it with their eyes, whatever the case may be. That's just one little practical thing in my experience I can look at and know that God has given us power to be able to choose thanksgiving, not grumbling, not complaining, to not just choose the knowledge of it. You know, when, when I use that verse in Philippians, I don't remember, chapter 3, I believe, last time I shared, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings that I may know Him. That was His goal. It wasn't to know about Him. It was to know Him. And again, I really want you to hear me critically. I'm not just trying to give you a good, you know, little check-it box lesson to take with you about how to live your life better. I'm talking about knowing the Lord in a more intimate and deep way so that this truth rises out of your heart's desire towards Him, out of love for Him. It's experience, it's practice. Look at what happened to Paul in Acts, Acts 16. You all know this verse, I won't, this, this story. I won't make you go back and reread it. 
But when he was arrested, because you remember he uh, cast that spirit of divination out of the girl, and she was providing great income to those that were her watchoverers, and so it, it, they caused the rabble, ended up, Paul ends up in jail. I do want to read the one verse to you, Acts 16, because I want you to hear it again, what their response was. And, and I want to put that in context, because it's, an, it's a, one of those stories that can become so familiar to us if we've heard it since we were in Sunday school or Bible school or whatever the case, that we may lose the context of the reality of it. Here's Paul. Let's start in verse 16. I'll just read the whole thing fast. I'll read fast anyway. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out to the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace and to the rulers, and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together, as they often do, against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now picture this with me if you can, and I'm no expert, but I, I can get an image if I stop myself for a minute to try to picture the detail of this. This is not like, we're not talking like days later. We're talking out a period of hours within they were beaten, severely beaten. Some of you know what severely beaten is like more than others. I know what it is to have my dad or my papa put a switch or a paddle on my hind end for a few licks to remind me of who was in charge. I've never known what it's like to be beaten. So I have no personal connection with that except to say what I've seen, you know, in, in a movie or a picture, and it, it's horrific. It's horrific. It's not a pain that's just like there for a moment and then it's gone. These, these men, these were men. These weren't supernatural superheroes. These were men were suffering physical, horrific pain. They were suffering distress. They were by themselves. They were you know, bound in shackles with their feet. They were, you know, probably in a dank, cold, rat-infested place. I can only imagine what the condition was like. Think about being in that moment and choosing to start praising the Lord, to start singing unto Him. Now, I see Sister Keisha doing what I do. I look at that and I go, it just, that just doesn't seem possible. That same spirit, which dwells in those men, dwelt in those men, dwells in you if you're born again. It dwells in you, it dwells in you, it dwells in me. We have that ability, if that's the right term to use, we have that freedom to be able to express that praise to Him in everything. Now you ask yourself the question, what were they praising Him for? I don't know. It doesn't tell us specifically what they gave a thing for. Maybe they were just thankful that they as faithful servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, did what they were commanded to do and were able to bear some of that suffering with Him. They were able to, to just share what one little bit of that suffering of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross on their behalf. You know, that rising up in them, thank you, Lord, that I can just be able to bear a little bit of that testimony, the same thing, experience that same. I don't know what they experienced. I just know it was real for them. It wasn't like they were saying, <laughs> not like they would have had this, but they said, remember what the message said last week? Uh, and everything give thanks. So let's, uh, let's see, what, what song can we come up with? And let's start singing the hymn. It rose, just, just the way you were preaching this morning, it rose right out of their being. They were new creations in Christ Jesus. And that new creation life in them just bubbled up like a living fountain in them and directed their focus and their attention away from the horridness of their physical pain and their suffering to a glory much, much greater than that. 
What a beautiful thing that is that the Lord's enabled us to do. He didn't do that of His own strength. He's the one that said, I can do all things. How? Through Christ who strengtheneth me. He knew where, where that source had to come from. So move this into the practical for yourselves and say, well, you know, and, and this seems so obvious in some ways, but let's go to the Word about it. What should we be thankful for? A couple of examples. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Interesting place to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. If I wrote down the right one. But thanks be to God, which giveth, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right there. Sit on that one. Thanks be to God, who giveth us the victory, no matter what. Through Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always, there's that always word again, causes us, I don't know why that's really hard for me to get out that King James, causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, I could go off on a whole other message here because it gets exciting to me to realize that if we will choose, if we will honor the Lord by being in a position of thanksgiving, immediately we will become a savor to the lost. It'll either be a savor of Christ that draws them to salvation or it's going to be a savor that in their own rejection they're going to move away because it is not natural. Hear me clearly, as if you don't know. It is not natural to choose thanksgiving in horrible circumstances. So if you genuinely look to the Lord and give Him thanks, what an incredible testimony. What a savor that is to the people that are around you. And May God use that for us in a level of conviction that when we choose the opposite, what are we proclaiming to those lost around us? That we're no different than they are. That we get ticked off when our car breaks down just like they do. No, the Lord's given us something different, a different way to walk. And that in and of itself is not, I mean, we, we need to preach the gospel. <laughs> the gospel's got to be preached, but we also need to live the reality of it in our lives. And this is one area where the Lord convicts me of seeing that so clearly. So in everything, for everything. Let's look at some of those things that we don't like and see what it produces. Look in the book of James. These are going to be familiar verses to you. James 1, James chapter 1, we want to look at verse 2 to 4. And he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So right there is an example of what those difficult circumstances, if we give thanks in, what we can give thanks for, that when we experience those temptations, when we experience those trials, the Lord has put us in that place. He's put us in that rock tumbler to be able to be more and more like Him in His image, having patience developed in us, that example of patience, that fruit of the Spirit, and that's what it is better than example, that was not a good word, the fruit of the Spirit of patience to be exemplified in our lives. What about Second Peter chapter 1? I'm sorry, First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Let's read from verse 3 down to 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, there it is again, hath begotten again, hath begotten to us again a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept, how? by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then he says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perish, 
though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And you know what I love about that? It takes the whole focus away from us. Because if we honor Him by walking in the Spirit in this way, what is the fruit of that? What's the end of that? Praise and honor and glory to Jesus. I don't want people to look at me and say, man, you're just such a patient dude. How do you do that? I don't, I don't want that. I don't need it. But if they see that the only source of that is from the Lord Jesus Christ that made me a new creation, then it praise and honor and glory as I deal with diverse temptations, diverse difficulties, much more precious than gold, much more precious than silver. Look at Hebrews 12, see what it says it yields in, in this case. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 5 to 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, my son. Hear that. That's a glorious thing to begin with. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all ye are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now, no chastening, exclamation point, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We have a process that the Lord's designed for us because He loves us as His children because He is a Father to us, because we are not bastards. He allows this to come in our lives so that it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Isn't that what Paul was experiencing? Isn't that what Silas was experiencing in that moment? The peaceable fruit of righteousness that allowed them to just break forth in song? Pick on Miss Barbara. She gave me an example recently, and she didn't give this to me for any lauding of herself, but... She's telling tell me about trouble she's having with her van. And, and in the midst of that, which is an ongoing thing, she said she interacts with a, a, a mechanic that she goes to. The neatest thing about this story, Miss Barbara, was that it was just a perfect exa example of, in my flesh. Of, uh, it'd be one of those things, especially I can remember when I was really, really poor, and I'm not really not poor now, but I was really poor when I had seven kids and was trying to, to raise them. And one little... Tinker Chang or whatever in our 15 passenger van, which was the only way we could get around, was like in my in my being. So anytime I hear anything related to vehicles, especially dummy here who doesn't know how to fix anything, hardly knows how to change oil, it was it was a terrifying thing to me. So that's why my ears perked when you started this example. But what Miss Barb was sharing with me is that she said that every time she gets to go to interact with this man, she gets to share about the Lord with him. And immediately it was like the Lord just gave me a really practical illustration of giving thanks in everything because she doesn't have to give thanks that her van is, is in trouble, wacky. But in the midst of the wacky van, the Lord has purposed and sovereignly moved to give her opportunity to interact with a man who needs to hear the truth and the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just one small example. And if I went around this room, and I can guarantee if I had time, I would be tempted to do so. Every one of you that know the Lord could think back and you could give an example of where something in your life that seemed like it was an opposition to you, in other words, it seemed bad, it seemed whatever, how the Lord turned that in a gigantic way. If Brother Jordan and Miss Pam ever have the chance that they haven't shared with you the testimony about their, their precious son, that in and of itself is a gigantic illustration of what I'm talking about. So we can, we can go across the whole gamut of horrific to not so horrific 
and yet see how in the midst of every one of those always situations, the Lord gives opportunity for us to give thanks to Him and to know that He's good and that He's always good. He is always good. And anything that we perceive in ourselves of being bad is just because we misunderstand what His purposes are about. We can look at it face to face with Christ our Savior and know that it's in His hands. You know those big Bible words? Well, they're not even Bible words, they're theological words. Omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence of God and all those things describe Him perfectly and there's biblical foundation for every one of them. But if you just let those things kind of get out there and, and get lost in the loftiness of the words and don't let it come down into your heart to understand that when we say that God is omniscient, it means that we know He knows every single thing beyond our ability to understand it. He knows every single thing. He is omnipresent. He is with us. He is everywhere we go in every circumstance. And He is omnipotent. He is powerful to move in all those circumstances that we encounter. If we will stop ourselves in the Spirit and, and meditate, the word salah is used throughout the Psalms. It means stop and think on these things. It means, and you, and you have to do it. It's a discipline for you to do that. It's a discipline for me to do that, to stop ourselves in the midst of all this wacky emotional stuff that rises up in our flesh and, and the places we can run to in a skinny second and go back to the Word of God and go back to the truth and stand on what He has spoken to us is truth because it's either truth or it's not truth. And if you believe and you say with your mouth it's truth, then go to that truth and stand on that truth even if your emotions are telling you the exact opposite in that circumstance of what's going on. I'm preaching to myself, I'm preaching to myself, hear that. It basically comes down to us in many ways redefining for ourselves what good is. See, we let good get defined in a very sinful way. Again, we'll, we'll define good by what, what feels good to me, what benefits me, what makes it easy for me. That's good. You know what I'm saying? If, if it's hard for me, that's bad. That's a bad thing. Well, let God define what's good for you. Let Him define from His Word what is good. And I can guarantee you anything that comes from Him because He is perfectly good is good in how it works in us. I read this quote and I thought it was really neat because it takes it away from just getting stuck on getting from just getting stuck on the blessing or the st stuck on the good what we call good thing to getting it back to the one who gives that good thing. Before I read that dumb quote, it's not a dumb quote, it's a good quote, but it's not the Bible. James 1:17, I want you to hear it straight out of the scripture first. Every good gift Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Neither shadow of turning. No variableness. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday and forever. No variables, no shadow of turning. He's always good. He's always going to be good. It's His very character. It's who He is. Let those blessings, let those good, good things in your mind or the not so good things in your mind, don't get stuck on the things. Let it turn you to thanksgiving and praise to the one who gives it to us. The quote said this, Thanksgiving is a response to more than God's blessings. It's a response to what we learn about Him through them. More than naming or listing gifts, we get to know the giver. And isn't that ultimately what the whole thing is about? It's about the relationship we have with Him. I want to finish with this third point, and it's going to seem maybe overly practical, but I think it's a good word here. We need to learn to speak it out. Not just in our brains, not just say in our minds, in the middle of those things, thank you, Lord, thank you, you know, thank you for this, thank you for that. Speak it out. Learn to speak it out. And I want to tell you where I see this Exemplified. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. I don't I honestly don't think this is out of context. If I'm wrong, Brother Jordan will correct me. And if he doesn't, Brother Timmy will correct me when he gets back. But Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. And then he tells us what that sacrifice is. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, the only way I can see the fruit of my lips being is when I speak something. Seems pretty obvious to me. That's the fruit of my lips. So I want to encourage you in a very practical way. Don't just stop. If you are obedient to the Spirit in the midst of that thing, to at least choose the right thing, in other words, to choose thankfulness and gratitude to Him, don't just stop there. Speak it out to Him. Speak it out to whoever's around you. Just get it out of your mouth. Let the fruit of your lips, that may be involved like in a real formal testimony. Well, yeah, that's great. I love that too. It can be right there in the car. And I told you the Lord gave me a spanking right after I was going after preaching that message at the rest home, I was going up to ministry time in Pilot Mountain the next day. I got barely on 52 from my office. I was working on Saturday. I barely got on 52 within three minutes. Dead still traffic on 52. This is a Saturday. It's holiday season. Why in the world would you have traffic stopped on a Saturday to do construction? So I'm going to be late now, and I'm texting Brother J.D. going, I'm stuck in traffic. I'll get there as soon as I can, whatever. And all this stuff is rising up in me. And so finally I get off the road, and I'm zipping around the other way, you know, and then I get onto, I don't know what that was, other road, one of the side roads, make it maybe five minutes, dead stop traffic again because everybody else is doing the same thing I am. And so I'm feeling all this grumbling, and I'm like, but in my mind, I'm like, I'm headed to do ministry downtown, and I'm stuck in traffic. <laughs> and the Lord laughs at me, and not, not, I didn't hear a laugh in the car. I'm, I'm, maybe I should have, but he says, what did you just preach yesterday? And immediately, I stopped myself, praise the Lord, and I tried my best in the flesh to begin with to find, what, what am I thanking him for? Thank you, God, for a car. Thank you, God, that I am still moving only at three miles per hour. It's th it's, it was very babyish, and I'm embarrassed even, you know, I'm just being real with you. It started very babyish. Yeah, and it got beyond that, praise the Lord, to the point where it could be a focus. And I'm giving you such a doofus example, but honestly, that's who we are. You know, in our flesh, if we let ourselves go to the flesh, we're that childish about things. But I can guarantee you that if we will be diligent to practice this, and I mean it, it's a discipline. It's the same way you have to study your word to memorize it. It just doesn't happen to you. You can't stick it under your pillow and it pop into your brain. You need to practice this. We need to be diligent in our discipline and our honoring of the Lord to practice this. We need the help of our brothers and sisters that when we start to move into that other side, when we start to speak that complaining, that we love one another enough to say, stop. I doubt my wife will do that, and it's probably a good thing, but she's going to gently say, listen to yourself. Whatever that gentle way is that we nudge one another. We need to nudge one another because we're missing an opportunity to give praise and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ in that moment. And, he, and if he tells us in everything to give thanks... He's enabled us in everything to give thanks. Thank you, brother. The verse, another verse you probably have on your refrigerator, Psalm 1914, says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That is, that, did I say that right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's getting it out of us. It's speaking it forth. It's making a declaration. When all those psalms, when you read those psalms, and especially when they talk about in the congregation, and I can guarantee you when David was out in the middle of the pasture being a shepherd, that he wasn't just meditating in his mind about things. I can guarantee it was coming out of his lips, the fruit of his lips. I want to close in a way with a negative example, but it's, it, it's, it needs to sober us because it really brings the, the dichotomy between we, when we are lost in our sin and have no other power to do anything differently versus we, when we are born again and we're made new creations. In Romans 1, look at this, and I want you to hear this admonition or this exhortation or this definition of where men are in their darkness, where we were if we're born again, where we were in our darkness. 
before the Lord saved us. But I want you to, I'm, I'm obviously pinpointing one particular part of this. I'm just starting in verse 18. So Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath sowed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's truth. They are without excuse. We were without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. Do you hear that? No gratitude, no thanksgiving, because they're seeing the revelation of God in nature all around them, but they don't acknowledge it, and they won't give thanks to Him for it. That's darkness. We are not in darkness if we're saved. We've been given the very power of the Holy Spirit to walk in light and truth and to be thankful people thankful people, not fake smile plastered on my face, give you a positive making, what is that saying old Joel tells us, Joel Osteen tells us, making lemonade out of lemons or whatever, not that kind of fake thing. I'm talking about the real thing that rises up because we choose to take our eyes, we choose to take our eyes off the circumstance and we look to the giver of every good and perfect gift in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. I got so excited, Brother Jordan, when you, you, you weren't focused on this verse this morning, but when, when you read it, it just, it was like another, it was an exclamation point for me. So we're going to close with Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. If you're born again in this room tonight, this is what you can meditate on. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Abounding with thanksgiving. That's my prayer for you tonight. It's my prayer for me tonight. Not just that we kind of get a clue about it. Not that we just kind of feel a little pricked about it, but that we are so moved by the word of the Lord, by the the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would walk out different people abounding in thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the truth of your word. Father, I thank you so much that you've given us that power of your spirit to be able to walk in such thanksgiving. And most importantly, that we, Lord God, we who are so wretched, so dead, so lost in our sin, that having been born again by your hand, by your word, by the blood of the Lamb, Lord, that we're able to walk in a way, Father God, that would exemplify a life filled with thanksgiving unto you, Lord. I pray that would be what people would see in us, Lord. It would be what would draw people to you, Father, through us, Lord, through our testimony, Lord. Thank you for the conviction of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you don't leave us as bastards, Lord, that you treat us like children and and discipline us and grow us up, Lord God, and want us to become more and more in your image, Lord God, so that we might just show forth your praise and your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.